Sorry, we're having a bit of problem sharing the screen on, on TV here. Um, Peter, Peter, I don't know if you might be able to help. Zoom. So, you can see, you can see there's two screens available, right? Um, screen. Two is this one, screen one. Okay. Still not coming up. So it's not to share to that screen. Not to share to that screen, I'm only got. There, I don't know. Pick it up. Again. It happened before. And we just share it. Sharing questions. Okay, I stop share. Uh, the presentation. It says two, right? Screen two. Yep. Screen two, this one. So it's, uh, but that's just what you're sharing. Right. So you need to decide what you want to share and then where it goes. Okay, so we're sharing this on Zoom. Because you know, the room is separate from the Zoom, isn't it? Uh, so you just want it to be the same as what you've got on the Yes. Room. It should be picked up from here. Yeah. It's almost as if it's picking. So you want to replicate the screen. Right. That is going to be a screen the, uh, for the screens themselves. Yeah, that thing you have with the one in the display two. setting. Yeah. Yeah. You want something that says duplicate screen. Yeah, you don't want it to stand if you want to. Oh, so, uh, I think you want to replicate rather than show out the other one. That should mean that I show that. Is that what you want? Yeah, that's what I want to. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what I want to do. So we can do it. So this is being shared. So they can. Right. 
outside this will make it uh, very good screen. Very good. Okay. Uh, I just stop sharing for a minute and only share the presentation. Okay, Sorry about that. Uh, Tony, do you want to? Yeah. All right. Good. Good morning, everybody. Um, for our first first session on um, is is on um, <clears throat> impact of climate change in the Pacific Islands and Bangladesh. And for our first session, I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Une Krishnan Nair. Uh, Mr. Nair is is head of climate change at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, he is an expert in climate change adaptation and mitigation, with 20 years of experience of climate projects, policies, finance and funds, as well as climate vulnerability and livelihood issues in the rural development context of, of India and the least developed countries. Um, Mr. Nair will talk for about 20 minutes, um, after which we'll have a second speaker from Bangladesh who will be speaking on, on Zoom. At the end of these two sessions, we'll have a Q&A session for, for, the, for everybody. So um, I would like to introduce Please, Mr. Mr. Nayer. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you uh, very much for the UNA Lisa for organizing this very timely um, <clears throat> discussion and uh, acknowledge the presence of the town mayor Lisa Skaven, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, so. The the uh, so we I, I'm coming straight away from the Commonwealth Heads of the Government meeting, uh, which took place in Rwanda um, uh, last month, and uh, we had a lot of discussions on climate change, climate impact, and uh, we've tried getting into solutions, but um, of course to bring in countries together and have lasting solutions for this particular issue of climate change, which includes adaptation for the most vulnerable and mitigation, which is basically to reduce the emission. Um, it's a daunting task, but uh, just would like to um, give some reflections from what we are doing as the Commonwealth Secretariat um, in support uh, for climate action in the Pacific. Um, so just have a, a few slides to um, That's it. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> just would like to bring um, the focus on to Pacific, basically from the IPCC's uh, assessment report that uh, throws uh, uh, or that gives a very clear picture that the average temperature has already <clears throat> uh, gone about 1.51 degrees Celsius, and we have already started seeing the uh, the impact. Uh, and definitely ocean acidification has increased uh, and will increase further with the 1.5 degree of global warming, uh, affecting the health of the reef ecosystems and uh, the other local fishing, which is basically impacting the livelihoods of um, uh, millions of people dependent on that. And of course, the global trends of rising seas uh, will have the most severe consequence in the Pacific, um, because it's not only the livelihood, but it's also the ecosystem which is linked to the tourism and other industries that's uh, providing financial support for the countries. Um, so sea level rise coupled with uh, storm surges and king tides have exacerbated uh, the, the issue. And it's basically already affected the fragile ecosystems in the Pacific. Actually, I'm, uh, I'll talk about specific examples from countries. Um, rising seas are also eroding the coastal areas, causing the shorelines to retreat. And of course, the, econo uh, the exclusive economic zones are currently being impacted because that's where the investments come for the countries. And of course, uh, the marine resource-based economy is flourishing there, but that's being impacted. And so we saw in the post-COVID situation how difficult it was for countries to come back uh, in the tourism sector. And when we have back-to-back -back, uh, natural disasters, uh, to the tune of tsunamis in Tongo, to Tonga, um, 
to the to the super cyclones in Fiji and others. So obviously the intensity of these. So I think one thing that we have observed when I was in Fiji in one of the super cyclone is the time it takes for a cyclone to build from a category three to category five. Um, we used to get uh, at least 24 hours before, uh, but this is happening now in eight hours and six hours interval. So that's basically causing a great deal of stress to the administration to gear up uh, to deal with the disasters because the intensity of storms and intensity of the wind speed increases in lesser and lesser time and builds into category one to category three to category five and, and thus the destructions and damages actually. So, so what do we need to do? The UN considers climate security agenda as a key entry point for risk-informed development in the Pacific region. So we need concrete actions at community level where climate impact uh, is to be linked to the livelihood security because right now uh, for many countries, it's an economic issue, it's a, it's a livelihood issue, but for most of the small states, it's an existential issue. Um, the moment you have a slight variation in the weather pattern leading to high intensity rainfall, that potentially would lead to loss of lives and loss of um, uh, daily livelihood. So the Commonwealth, as I said, the heads of the government met in 2022 in June um, uh, to, to discuss this issue and the urgent threat of climate change is recognized now. And the communique of the Commonwealth, the Chogam 2022, speaks very clearly about the need for action. And uh, we brought together all countries to agree on this aspect of urgent threat of climate change because um, that was a mitigation issue for some countries. Uh, it was an adaptation and livelihood issues for some countries, but now I think the countries have all started coming together and accepting the fact, um, and I think my um, co-speaker will talk about Bangladesh uh, currently reeling under a flood uh, of, uh, of an unseen intensity from the last 120 years, actually. So imagine Bangladesh of the size of New York uh, having um, uh, around 150 to 200 million people having around 700 rivers. If there is a climate flux, that's basically going to throw the entire country off gear, and that's what is happening right now. Um, so as uh, the Commonwealth, what uh, is the solution that we offered? Um, so this was uh, in 2015 um, in the Commonwealth Heads of the Government meeting in Malta that uh, the Commonwealth Climate Finance Access Hub was established basically to support the member countries in climate action, so in tangible action in terms of accessing finance and doing projects of transformative scale that ideally leads to changes in the ground. Um, so that's, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very country demand driven process, embedded action, and uh, we, we also go for a balanced approach of human and institutional capacity building. So currently, um, I have advisors sitting in um, 16 plus member countries uh, in the um, Caribbean, Pacific, as well as in the Asia Pacific region um, and uh, the African region, which is an ever growing uh, presence uh, for us looking at the vulnerabilities. Um, so, so basically this is a, a, a process where we are embedding advisors in the country to support the most um, uh, important task of developing project proposals. Um, because he, here we have a, a, a situation where the small island development states and the least developed countries do ask for a lot of financial support to um, enhance climate action. Um, we do have resources, uh, uh, thankfully, the uh, government of UK, the government of Australia, many other Commonwealth member countries have substantially supported in taking the climate action process forward. But the question is that, uh, do we have capacities in these countries to absorb this money and to convert this financial support to transformative projects? I think that's where the challenge uh, is. Definitely, I think the, the requirement is huge and that's, a, that's still a pertinent question. But on the other hand, we also need to build the institutional capacities of our member countries to absorb this finance. So, so what do we do in countries? We support in concrete adaptation and mitigation project development. We support climate policy development because enabling policies uh, is a need. Um, and climate finance readiness, uh, which includes accreditation, because for, to take this money, you need to have certain um, financial standards to absorb. And, and this is what we support member countries in setting. So, so I think the, the opening speaker talked about the, the role of commercial financial institutions, but many of the commercial financial institutions are linked to the 
specific banking norms and not to finance vulnerable communities because banking norms always give finance to the most resilient group who can pay back the resources. But for the most vulnerable, there's still no banking support. So you need a policy, a policy change there and of course institutional capacities and of course knowledge management and knowledge sharing. So as on date, we have supported in accessing around 50 million worth of climate finance for um, 16 member countries. And that includes majority of the projects. You will see 50 million is a small amount that we have access for the countries. But majority of the projects are of the scale of two to three million, but specifically focused on building the capacities, the institutional strength, uh, strengthening, and also setting up regulatory standards in the country to absorb this finance and deploy it and also implement it. Um, so some of the knowledge products that we have developed um, uh, specific to uh, the Pacific uh, includes um, our work that we did for Fiji, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, which actually has a lot, lot of replicability in the other member countries. And, uh, and since we are talking about Pacific, the next Commonwealth Heads of the Government meeting is going to be in Pacific in Samoa. Um, so Samoa will be the next chair. And so we are already working with the government of Samoa and the focus is now tilting towards the Pacific actually. The Secretary General Patricia Scotland is currently in the Pacific Island Forum for this meeting. So I don't know, it's a coincidence, very timely that we were preparing a parallel presentation for Pacific that I could use some inputs here. So a specific project that we are um, uh, currently working in the Pacific uh, with the UK government and also with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research is what we call the Common Sensing Initiative. So we've seen that there's lack of data, lack of technology that could be deployed in the Pacific to make the change actually. So lack of data we have seen even in the, in the post-COVID situation that how significant is the importance of data, especially unbiased data, uh, to, to, to take decisions. I also, uh, because um, uh, I was in the UNFCCC um, when we wrote the Paris Agreement, actually, so we were in the drafting group that wrote the Paris Agreement, and, and of course in Chogam. So we, we hear member countries coming back saying that, okay, we, we are not fully in line with the IPCC report, whether what they say uh, we need our internal science to substantiate. So obviously we found that the most unbiased data is the satellite data which is basically the earth observation data that is real time that's coming from the satellites. So we designed the project with our partners to, to use this climate information and the climate data to take decisions in the ground level in terms of project development. So one of such projects is, um, uh, is common sensing. It's an innovative project based on partnership with Fiji, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu uh, to support build climate resilience and uh, enhance decision making using unbiased data. So we do have um, the, the data streams and also climate information risk layers and also information from the ground, which is like validated with the community, uh, to, to, uh, which is being provided to the national focal points in the country to enable them to use that data to develop projects, which then becomes undisputed for the funding lines. Because otherwise, one question or two questions probably will push that particular project out of the board meeting of that particular funding line, leading to delays in approvals and, um, and acceptance. So the practical application of this platform, so we've been like doing this since 2018. So we have now supported countries in developing projects using the earth observation data. So this is currently a platform that is being set up in, in Fiji, Vanuatu and Solomon Islands. It's being currently supported by University of Portsmouth and uh, the satellite application Catapult. Um, so so we, we did come up with a discussion paper which is available in the Commonwealth uh, website. Um, which is basically on how do we use this earth observation technology in terms of uh, enabling action in the ground level. So um, my last slide, um, moving forward, what do we need to do in Pacific based on our experience from the last six years of functioning of the Climate Finance Access Hub is definitely enabling policies for low carbon climate resilient development. So when you look at uh, the huge investments that the, uh, the member countries uh, take on issues like water, forestry, drinking water supply, sanitation, uh, when we look closely into those proposals, many of them um, are designed um, using the business as the usual um, political standards uh, and, and not considering the climate changes and the variabilities uh, into consideration while designing these projects. So we need 
specific project proposal, I mean, all the project proposals to have a climate lens put in before developing those. And that's an important aspect. I think that applies to even develop, developing countries because I'm from India and I know we have one of the world's largest drinking water supply program uh, of 52 billion. Uh, but when you look very closely at uh, the climate variables and the potential risk that that can pose to that particular investment, it's uh, it's to be like evaluated and seen like how um, we do it. So, so the larger point is that enabling policy should allow the low carbon and climate resilient development in countries. Uh, adaptation and mitigation project with transformative impact. Um, when we look at many of the projects that we have now submitted to the Green Climate Fund or to the Adaptation Fund, they are at the scale of 30 to 40 million for the small countries. But if you look at the implementation and the scale of impact, that's still very limited. I think uh, that's that's an area where we need to pool in the resources, which include not only government, private, civil society. Civil society do have an important role to play to go together with these projects, build the capacities. Um, so we've like we've been working with the Commonwealth Foundation um, on building the capacities for some of the entities to deal with climate finance because uh, the Green Climate Fund is now allowing civil society organizations also to become accredited entities in terms of taking these projects forward. And the third is assured and customized climate finance catering to the needs of the region. So I'd, I'd like to highlight one aspect here, which is gender, which is an important element uh, and gender-based actions, especially in the climate finance space um, and the financial instruments do not sit together because many of the member countries, we find the land, uh, the land ownership is still with the male counterpart in the household. They're leading to a situation where the financial support for women-driven enterprises are still in its nascent phase. A lot of things need to be done. So we did an evaluation of all the nationally determined contributions that the member countries have submitted. And we saw that the gender mainstreaming and gender integration is still in its very nascent phase. At the same time, the majority of the vulnerable population, the house, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, people who are dependent on natural resources like water, firewood, et cetera, they are women and their linkages are not yet established very well. And the fourth issue is enhance human capacities to support climate action. So if you look at any government, there is a huge turnover of officials every time. So to build the capacities of a, of a critical mass of officials is a need. And that is what we are focusing on so that even if there is rotation of staff, which I think because most of the government, they are understaffed. So obviously, if still, if there are rotation, we need a critical mass who can chip in as and when the necessity comes. And institutional capacities to implement climate finance projects, I, I don't think that there still exist a lot of institutional capacities, but um, so for example, in Fiji, we work with the Ministry of Economy in Fiji to set, to set up their project design and development unit within the Ministry of uh, Economy, which is currently under um, approval process. But we, we need such institutional architecture in the government to see this kind of, uh, because, you know, uh, at, the, at the policy level, at, the international level, we, we always talk about we need action in the ground, but for ground level action to take effect, we need those institutions to be active, nimble, and uh, and having uh, having very clear mandate to work in that um, region. And last but not least, better knowledge management, uh, definitely for replication and upscaling. Uh, we see some of these small island states, like for example, Seychelles, um, the small uh, countries like Tongo, Tonga, for example, they do come up with um, extremely out of the box thinking. Like uh, for example, Tonga has come up with the Climate Act and they have a Tonga Trust Fund, which basically helps support in um, climate action at the country level because um, individual projects definitely uh, do give financial resources at a smaller scale. But the moment you have trust funds and the funding, um, uh, national funds within your country, then the scale of finance that you can access becomes substantially high, actually. So that makes the projects looking, uh, look big and also the impact looking a uh, large scale, actually. So, so in the closing, um, we, uh, I think um, every platform and every such discourses do have its uh, relevance because this needs a lot of effort and, uh, and, 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 a, and a lot of voices basically to move this uh, huge process of intergovernmental, because I was literally at this time drained when we did this uh, Commonwealth Heads of the Government meeting discussions where member countries do have their own priorities and just to bring them all together to have a unified action, it's basically a very, very, very uh, big task. And 
I think everyone uh, and every agency uh, should chip in now, and it's a very timely. Next 10 years is going to be super crucial, and I'm sure um, the town mayor might be facing all this kind of like because I imagine I'm coming from India where the rate of urbanization is around 70 people migrating per minute from rural to urban areas. And that's basically the kind of dynamics that we are facing in countries. And of course, with climate change adding on to that, that's going to be enormous, actually. So uh, thank you very, very much for this. And um, I look forward to the further discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, then, Tony, if you wouldn't mind introducing, yep. let me just broaden the screen. Right. Okay, okay. I would like to introduce. Is recording on? Yep. Uh, recording is on. So I'd like to introduce our, our second speaker from Bangladesh. Uh, we'll be talking about the, the Bangladesh experience. Uh, his name is Dr. Hathib Ifan Ula. Dr. Ifan Ula is a visiting research fellow at the Center for Sustainable Development of the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh in Dhaka. He received his PhD in Aquatic Ecology from the University of Liverpool. And his accomplishments include publishing 40 peer reviewed journal papers writing, editing 55 books and 140 articles on climate change and related topics. His talk will be on climate change, impact and action, and the story that Bangladesh tells us. Welcome, Dr. Ethan Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe you can see my screen as uh, clearly. Uh, it's a really great honor to be in this event, uh, although re from remotely. So it's a very good afternoon from Dhaka, Bangladesh, which is really, really hot. But I understand that uh, it is temperature is also quite high uh, where uh, you are based in uh, So uh, as uh, uh, it has been told that I will be talking about, actually, I will be telling the story of Bangladesh. Uh, it is about climate change, not only the impact we are facing, but what are the actions and uh, how to move forward. Bangladesh, uh, as you may know, which is a quite a small country, uh, 143 square, uh, thousand square kilometers. But only these four photographs can show that how diverse the ecosystem, the nature is. Uh, the riverine system, uh, we share the, the largest mangrove in the world, Sundarbans, with India. We have hilly forest, and uh, uh, on the north, uh, in the uh, northeastern part, we have fantastic wetland. Uh, some are quite uh, famous globally, like Kanwar Howe. But Bangladesh, given its location, since it is a delta, as you can see, it is crisscrossed with 700 rivers, more than that, actually and they are flowing from all over the region. So it is often said that 92% of water that flows through Bangladesh are coming from India, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, and China. Uh, that's why when we talk about Bangladesh, often we find it is synonymous with disaster like floods. And uh, in recent decades, climate change is also become another name for Bangladesh. But it is not new. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Sharia mentioned in his uh, keynote uh, speech, that uh, we are just uh, moving out of the one of the worst floods in decades, uh, which happened in northeastern part of Bangladesh, which is Simet region, and uh, you know within a few days, 90% uh, of the whole season's rain actually uh, occurred in Bangladesh in a very small span of time. It is also true in northeastern part of India, where water is coming from Bangladesh. 
But uh, given that fact, flood is happening in Bangladesh every year, but the problem is due to climate change, it is aggravating. And if you look into different ranking over the last 15 years or so, you can hardly find Bangladesh leaving the list of top 10 climate vulnerable countries in the world. It is really uh, amazing, alarming, and a great concern. There's a, a small uh, animation which shows that the rain which was supposed to come a bit later, uh, how it is actually occurring during May, June and flooding the whole Silet region um, where uh, the flood occurred just a couple of weeks back and still people are recovering. Uh, 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 rehabilitation is now the biggest challenge and there are forecasts that more water, more rain uh, is yet to come, so is flood. And it is not like that June is the, you know, the, 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 the most prominent month to have flood, no. We, we, will be, we will be seeing flood in July, in August, even in September. And it is not only 2022, we had very big flood in 1988, 1998, 2019, 2020. And the problem is the frequency is increasing. So is the extension or intensity. Uh, that's, the, that's the alarming part. It is not only flood we should be concerned about because of climate change but also cyclones, uh, tidal surges. As you can see from the diagram on the right-hand side, it showed that over the last couple of centuries, so many sitting uh, cyclones actually hit the coast of Bangladesh and damaged it immensely. But one question would be, since flood and cyclones are so common in Bangladesh, can we link it with climate change? Is there any evidence for that? We know from global studies, regional studies, but can we scale them down to a country uh, as small as Bangladesh? There are lots of uh, uh, debates and discussions going on whether you can link this uh, current flood to climate change. <clears throat> there are so many things happening in the country. You know, There are so many infrastructures are being built, uh, 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 sedimentation, sediments are coming in, these are creating shallowing the rivers and channels and canals. But just uh, five years back, there was another flood, uh, actually, which uh, happened, not flood, the uh, rainfall, which happened in April 2017. And there was a study done by a Bangladeshi uh, lady. Actually, she did her PhD uh, at the University of Oxford. And she showed that the rainfall, which happened only in five, in six days, that kind of pre-monsoon rainfall uh, the frequency will be doubled because of climate change, no doubt about it. The, the science is supporting. And 2017 was an amazing year for Bangladesh. Within a few months, in August, Bangladesh faced another flood, one of the worst floods that we faced. And there was a study on that event as well. And it showed that if the temperature, global temperature rises, two degrees centigrade, which we are trying to um, uh, that, that, so we are trying our best not to happen, but if the temperature rises two degrees centigrade, the flood we experienced in 2017, it will be more likely to happen. Um, you know, double the chance will be double. Uh, the, the amount of water which you discharge the, that will be 1.5 times more likely. So you can see that. Although climate change is a global phenomenon, but we can always connect what is happening in Bangladesh or elsewhere. We have heard from uh, Mr. Nair that so many things are happening uh, on the ground, uh, whether it is in the Pacific, in the Africa, in Africa or in Bangladesh. So the bottom line is yes, we can connect these extreme weather events with climate change. But are we uh, just uh, limiting on what is uh, happening? No. Bangladesh never did. And since climate change is happening, so is respond to climate change. Let me give you a couple of, a few examples. Due to salinity intrusion, storm surges, and sea level rises, water insecurity is a big challenge in coastal Bangladesh. Uh, so what can be done? Well, rainwater harvesting is one of the uh, options that we have been piloting as well as a screen up. Desalinization, 
desalinization plants, uh, community based, community managed. Those are being practiced, those are being piloted in Bangladesh and the coast to resolve the water insecurity problems. Another thing is safety concerns. When we have a storms, uh, which can be uh, very serious, sometimes these are termed as super cyclones. One happened just two, two, uh, two years back, uh, Cyclone Ampan on 20th May, 2022, in the middle of COVID. What can be done? Well, to help the fishermen so that their boat, uh, boats uh, do not get capsized, we designed stronger fishing boats. People, so that they can live in their house during the cyclones, uh, we designed uh, stronger house, houses so that uh, other neighbors um, actually can, can take shelter in those uh, stronger infrastructure. Talking about food insecurity, definitely it's a problem because of sanity, because of flood, because of drought. So our uh, agriculturists, the scientists, they are uh, inventing new crops, salt and drought tolerant crops. There are different management systems introduced like integrated fish and uh, rice culture. We also try our best to in, uh, incorporate renewable energy like introducing solar irrigation farm all uh, to uh, adapt, get adapt to uh, climate change. And we are also investing in nature-based solutions. I know that the, the government of the, the, the British government, FCDO are channeling, I will be talking about it uh, at the end of my presentation as well. They are very much a concern about climate change. That's why they are not only focusing on mitigation, but how to uh, uh, promote nature-based solutions like restoring degraded forests, preserving, conserving existing ones, or creating uh, coastal uh, new forests, like as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, over the last uh, 56 years, we have been creating green belt along the coast of Bangladesh. And it, those uh, uh, flood protection, flood rest, uh, sorry, for, forest uh, protection, forest restoration, forest creation, these are not only helping us to reduce cyclonic risks, but also it can help us to conserve water during um, rainless days, as well as sequester carbon. But all these small actions will not make any sense. As uh, Mr. Nair also mentioned that we need a structural change, policy change, so that we can scale things up. Now I will be focusing on what is, what is being done at the policy level in Bangladesh. Well, there are certain plans and policies which are very much focused on climate change, but there are certain short-term and long-term policies and plans as well, uh, strategy and, strategies and plans as well, uh, which also adopt climate change and respond to climate change in them. Let me start with climate focus ones. Uh, 2009 uh, was uh, one of the uh, important years for Bangladesh's uh, climate action, because at that time we developed or formulated Bangladesh's climate strategy and action plan, which is, uh, which is a 10 year long uh, planning document. And very recently, in fact, uh, earlier this year in, in January, Bangladesh government, uh, with the support from UNDP as well as Global uh, and Green Climate Fund, we have drafted National Adaptation Plan of Bangladesh, which will be guiding adaptation activities over the next uh, decade or so. But the, uh, apart from these climate-specific uh, action plans, we also have long-term plans, development plans. For example, Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100, which is 80-year long plan to make Bangladesh a resident delta. Bangladesh is also trying to become for the next 20 years or so. So we have a perspective plan uh, of Bangladesh. We also have five years uh, plan, which we uh, prepare in every five years. Currently, we are passing through the period of eight five-year plan. And finally, uh, I will be talking about a bit later, uh, very recently, Bangladesh prepared Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan. Mujib, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman is the father of the nation. 
commemorate his birth centenary, this plan was prepared uh, uh, at the end of last year. Now let us focus on Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. This plan implemented Bangladesh enacted Bangladesh Climate Change Trust Act. It established the trust. It allocated so far $450 million of its own money uh, and implemented 800 projects from this pot called Bangladesh Climate Change Trust Fund. So it is a kind of national trust fund. But definitely we received funding from the other donors, including the UK government which is called Bangladesh Climate Change Resilience Fund. That fund actually uh, stopped uh, being in operation in 2017, but that fund was, uh, was almost a $200 million fund, uh, which uh, supported 10 projects. Bangladesh, over the last seven years or so, it is preparing its climate budget. It, uh, it, is, it is being prepared alongside the national budget. I was just calculating the, how much money Bangladesh will be spending over the next one year or so, because our financial year starts on 1st July. And it is estimated that Bangladesh will be spending $3.4 billion over the next 12 months or so, which is 4.5% of our national budget, which is 75, uh, almost $75 billion. Pounds, uh, and it is 0.7% of our national GDP, which is uh, about uh, $500 billion. So you can understand how serious the country is to channel its uh, own money to different, through different ministries so that the action is being taken on the road. Coming back to Bangladesh, the Bangladesh's Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, I'm quite, as a Bangladeshi national, I'm quite proud of it because this plan not only talks about, you see, being Bangladesh a vulnerable country, we often talk about Bangladesh has to be resilient, resilient, resilient. But this plan for the first time shows a different trajectory for Bangladesh's development. No, not only being resilient is not enough. We have to prosper as well. So this plan actually shows us how we could take the direction from resilience to prosperity. Over the last couple of years, Bangladesh has been the president of Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is a forum of uh, 50 odd climate vulnerable countries. And during that time, this plan uh, was formulated or drafted. It is a plan which, which uh, expect that uh, $84 billion will be invested over the next eight years or so. And it will be focusing on adaptation, just transition, how to spend public revenue for the vulnerable people, uh, financing, using the technology for human and citizens' well-being, as well as how to maximize the resilience of power and transport sectors. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to the implementation of this plan. It is often said that given Bangladesh's experiences, Bangladesh's leadership in, uh, in, uh, among the least developed countries, especially in the area of adaptation, uh, we are often branded as adaptation capital of the world, adaptation teacher, adaptation leader. And because of this leadership, Bangladesh, two years back, almost two years back, the Global Center on Adaptation South Asia office was opened in Dhaka, uh, which also shows uh, how prominent Bangladesh has been despite its vulnerability to climate change, despite the uh, uh, increasing intensity of disaster. But we must admit climate change adaptation has its own limit. We need to appreciate that because there is a phenomena called losses and damages. When the adaptation fails, losses and damages start. And uh, 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 as you have heard that I have been uh, engaged with the uh, University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh and our vice chancellor is also present in this uh, in this uh, event uh, online. There we conducted a study. We tried to find out how much loss a particular event, extreme event, can cause to a specific single household. We visited three areas of Bangladesh: uh, north, east, north, uh, north, northeast, as well as south. And we calculated that a loss ranged from between. $568 and $1,054 per household per event. 
is an amazing number, given the fact the average per capita income of Bangladesh is around uh, 2,400 only. And a few years back, IIED London, they conducted a study on Bangladesh and they estimated that on average, every year, Bangladeshi rural communities are spending $2 billion every year to tackle climate change, to save them, protect them from climate change, which would be at least uh, almost 800, uh, uh, almost $100 per, family, per year. So you can see that the losses and damages are a very serious concern because adaptation might not work. So what we need to do, if we, if we see that we are in the, in the present, so in the past, as we have told, um, disaster is quite common, but it will be changing. On the left-hand side, we can see that the capacity of households of the community to tackle climate change, to tackle disaster, it can be low, it can be high. But in the future, we are expecting that natural disasters, extreme weather events, their frequency and intensity will be on rise. As a result, the losses and damages will be on rise as well. So this is the prediction. So since we are in the middle, what to be done? Well, if we take preventive measure, the losses and damage can be tackled to a certain extent. But we need to think long term. So we need to go, we need to add up so that losses and damage can be reduced. The problem is, given the intensity and the frequency of extreme weather events, we need to enhance our capacity. We need to enhance our adaptive capacity as time passes by. If we can't do that, that would be really, really damaging for us. So as you can see, since the intensity of uh, weather events are increasing, so we need to build our capacity so that we can fight the climate change and the disaster it, it, uh, it may cause. But Bangladesh can't fight that. I will give you a very quick example before I end my presentation. One is, although Bangladesh emits only 0.5% global carbon, despite the fact it has got more than 180 million people living in this on this delta, still Bangladesh promises that in the next eight years, it will be reducing its carbon emission by almost 7%. Even if there is no support coming from outside, if there are collaboration, if there is technology transfer, if there is funding coming, we may reduce carbon for another 15%. So altogether, it will be 22%. So we need uh, collaboration to, to, do, to, to make this a reality. Second example is uh, uh, from, the, from the UK. Bangladesh and UK has been collaborating to fight climate change since long. And I'm very proud to talk about this particular project the UK government has launched at the end of last year. Bangladesh Climate and Environment Program, which is $120 million, uh, million pound program will be running for five years. And this Bangladesh Focus Program will not only talking will not only be talking about renewable energy, pollution, strengthening governance or leadership, but also how nature-based solutions and locally led adaptation can be capitalized on and make a Bangladesh a resilient Bangladesh. So, as we have heard, Bangladesh has been facing disasters, natural calamities, which is aggravating over the last uh, couple of decades, but Bangladesh hasn't stopped there. Bangladesh is trying its best to fight these uh, adverse situations. It has made money available. It has changed its policies. It has got action plans in place, but there is a limit to all those. We need strong international and regional collaboration to not only make Bangladesh safe, but any other, all other vulnerable countries safe. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Right, we now have a Q&A session, uh, which will take us up to lunch. So anybody's welcome to ask any question to either Mr. Nair here or Dr. Ifanula, and um, 
if you if you could ask a question, I'll ask the uh, presenter to, to repeat the question as well, so everybody knows what the question is. Who would like to ask the first question? The last words from Mr. Abluba was strong international cooperation. Um, some of us here in spring 2021 held a meeting for small island citizens, small island southern states. I'm trying to get some element of that sense of cooperation here projected to Gali meeting last year, which didn't take place. The reason why we were keen to do that in the UN Association was to get some sort of evidence of that cooperation at COP26. We felt that was missing. Now we have Gali 2022. How do you both feel that that sense of international cooperation from very large Commonwealth countries, India, Canada, Australia, etc., matches up to the aspirations of SIDS and Belgian states um, has come out? It's very soon after Kigali, but I guess both of you know well enough that the vibrations underneath of what actually happens. So let's, let's have a look at this. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very interesting question, and uh, and that's one of the the burning debates in terms of uh, how COP26, and then further on in Kigali, how um, the the commitments from the, the 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 developed Commonwealth countries have enhanced. Or I'll say, um, I think COP26 in a way was a, a different COP um, compared to the COPs before, because uh, before we were by and large fighting to bring the agenda back to focus. For example, uh, we were trying to bring loss and damage back to focus. We are trying to bring adaptation finance um, and adaptation on par to mitigation. But now from COP26, we saw um, most of the par uh, parties, like they were, um, they were they were very keen on action, um, and to that extent, we did see a lot of financial commitment. Um, uh, I can't give you an exact figure, but but like if you look at resilient infrastructure, for example, so um, UK, Canada, and India came up with uh, what they call the resilient infrastructure fund. Um, uh, so so that was an initiative, like the the, the coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure was given. Um, similarly, um, in Chogam, um, in, in one of the climate breakfasts that we organized uh, with the heads of government, Australia did announce uh, um, a very prominent Pacific-focused climate finance um, uh, support of more than um, 250 million. And uh, similarly, uh, the U.S. in the Caribbean region, like, for example, the Americas, um, uh, increasing um, support to the Caribbean regions, which was uh, highlighted even in the CARICOM heads of government meeting recently. So I think uh, it gives, at least it gives me an impression that uh, things are moving in the right direction and moving forward. Um, and if you look at the commitment that the larger countries have made uh, over the last two years, uh, uh, including COP26 in the run-up to Chogam, and then of course uh, in uh, COP27, I think there is a uh, there is an increasing uh, intent from the part of the countries to support the small island development states. Uh, it's not only um, uh, from the uh, from the bilateral support process, but it's also ab about the regional stability uh, because the regional stability is. is it's being impacted by climate. So of course that leads to trade issues, that leads to all, all other um, say primary, secondary and tertiary impact. So obviously I, I, mean, I, I, I see it from a very positive light and there is an increasing momentum. But as I said, if you look at Bangladesh's uh, requirement for resilience uh, or low carbon development or to that, in that matter, even if you take a small island development, so that will run into billions actually. So that's basically something which still needs a lot of support, continued support. But I'll also say that uh, private sector finance is something which is still not tapped. So in COP27, the Commonwealth Secretariat is focusing on an official UNFCCC side event with a very clear focus on enhancing um, more and more private sector finance 
um, to um, enhance the public financing or to 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 kind of um, uh, improve the efficiency of the public investment. So that'll be my um, yeah, thank you very much. I don't know whether Hazib would like to add um, onto this question. No, I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Nair, you, you have uh, pointed out all the important points that we often discuss uh, and the gaps we see. Uh, definitely, there are challenges of uh, climate finance, whether 100 billion is coming every year or not, whether uh, COVID is an issue or a, or, a, or a excuse not to do that. Definitely, Bangladesh is a tapping global fund like Green and Climate Fund, as well as bilateral funds. But the challenge is, uh, you know, adaptation and mitigation, finding a balance between these two issues, uh, because often we see that only 20% uh, fund is uh, allocated for adaptation, where countries like Bangladesh demands more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nair, for uh, highlighting those issues. Thank you. Some 20 years ago, UN scientists were very concerned about the impact of climate warming on the glaciers and the ice fields and the high canal. Studies were made, and one of the implications was that these ice fields were already melting. And the moraines and natural surface bands of the water were also becoming very good. There would be major flash floods coming down the Ganges and some vulnerable people. Uh, I wondered if you have seen any scientists in Bangladesh. Second question relates to the British MOP some 20 years ago for the analysis of worldwide crises might appear over the next 20 years. Yeah, I think uh, Hazib, the question uh, number, the first question, uh, I think both questions were um, targeted to Bangladesh and the specific examples. So I think the first one was around the glacier uh, melting and of course the glacier, uh, uh, the, the glof kind of phenomenon, you know, the glacier lake burst outburst and flash flood. So, so the question was like, is there any, any uh, impact of such flash floods uh, recently? Uh, which, which I think the scientific community warned um, uh, way before in Bangladesh. Um, and I think the second question was uh, more on to, um, uh, I forgot the second question. Uh, the water, yeah. So the... Uh, Okay, so it's it's about um, uh, both the, the issue of uh, plenty of water and um, uh, less water, and of course um, whether there is there is uh, 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 a kind of a migration or a climate migrants going from Bangladesh to India or any any neighboring countries uh, for this particular reason. Is there any any evidence there actually? Yeah. So um, yeah, those those were the two questions. If I'm right. Thank you so much for, uh, because I couldn't, I couldn't hear. Thank you very much for summarizing it. Yes, uh, GLOF is uh, indeed a big challenge, especially in, uh, in the Himalayan region where most of our water is coming. But uh, the current, the recent flood, it is being told that the rainfall, because the rainfall, the phenomena, it, it is totally changed. Um, uh, we have uh, rain, which was supposed to have throughout uh, the year, 90%, uh, 80% actually happened within three days. So you can imagine how much rain happened. So it is not necessarily the bluff uh, uh, creating any uh, uh, impact directly. Uh, maybe there is indirect, uh, but uh, in this particular case, uh, I would say the potential rainfall that happened. Um, of course, there are other issues as well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, infrastructure so that water can't actually move. Uh, and, uh, and go out quickly in a particular area, which is supposed to happen. The other question, yes, uh, water scarcity is a big issue. 
uh, and we are trying to kind of academically we are trying to link climate change and the migration but uh, frankly speaking uh, there are so many uh, social issues as well internal displacement definitely that is happening uh, from uh, river eroded areas to the uh, nearest cities or to the capital even there are evidence for those internal displacement because of climate uh, change or climate induced phenomena but i haven't seen any strong evidence that because of climate change are migrating from Bangladesh to neighboring country. There are assumptions that happen. There are lots of uh, what you call it prediction that uh, you know 15 million people will be climate migrant by 2030 or something like that. Uh, but uh, I'm not aware of any specific because, as I say, there are so many push and pull factor attributing climate change to that particular migration, inter-country migration is really challenging. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, no, uh, I think uh, uh, Hazib answered it uh, well. Yeah, I don't want to add anything. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, the impact of the economic development. Um, it'd be quite understandable that developing countries would think that their own need is adaptation to climate change and they, they can't make much contribution to reducing climate change. However, developing countries all aspire to improve their economies and how optimistic are you that you can develop your economies without contributing to climate change? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And uh, if I can take uh, maybe some examples to, yeah. So, so, so the, I think the question is uh, um, uh, uh, the, the kind of, uh, you know, like when, when you are a developing economy, obviously your, your uh, mandate is to have more resilience for your uh, developing, um, uh, what do you call, um, population. And of course, uh, to, to definitely provide all kinds of amenities and support, but at the same time, be more low carbon and resilient. Um, but at the same time, um, the, the issue of mitigation versus adaptation, actually. So uh, if you take the example of uh, countries of the global south, uh, basically, uh, adaptation is an important uh, aspect um, because the, the general rhetoric is that uh, um, it's it's the emissions from the developed world that has led to the current situation. And then we are in the kind of uh, developing uh, trajectory and would like to give uh, an, or show an aspirational ladder to our uh, citizens uh, and definitely not to limit that in the name of uh, mitigation. Uh, but at the same time, we know that it's inevitable that the climate change consequences will be uh, coming in and we will have to face it. This adaptation is an important need. Like, for example, if we look at most of the uh, developing countries, uh, there's a great deal of dependence on natural resources for their livelihood. Like, for example, forests. The forests, uh, that's where the mineral wealth is sitting and you will have to depend on deforestation and you will have to depend on sustainable use of that. But of course, emission is a, is a byproduct. Uh, you look at coastline. So for, if you take uh, countries like India and Bangladesh, we do have a huge coastline. So obviously that makes you very vulnerable. Then your dependence on water, both perennial and um, uh, um, uh, other uh, glacier fed uh, and non glacier fed rivers actually so that makes you all the more vulnerable so so you know like we have a situation where we we need to do the development uh, so mitigation is definitely uh, an aspect that need to be taken uh, care of at the same time we need to also ensure that uh, the growing population is fed and fed in a resilient way but the positive side of it is like if you look at uh, <clears throat> the the urban infrastructures in some of these developing economies, uh, for example, green buildings is becoming a norm. Um, for example, the financial institutions are gearing up for differential interest rate financing for green uh, buildings. Um, and then earlier it used to be kind of one off islands of success, but now it's getting gradually and steadily streamlined. Smart cities. 
So that's becoming a, a, a kind of a norm again thing that you, you cannot go for the business as usual development, even if you are a developing country, whatever may be the political, uh, uh, what you call positions that the member countries take. But uh, internally, if you look um, uh, at many of these countries, there are standards coming up. So a couple of examples, one is smart cities, definitely. There is a lot of adaptation mitigation components and uh, <clears throat> which include sustainable transport. So, so I think one of the largest or evolving e-mobility spaces are the uh, developing economies actually, including Bangladesh, India, China, many others, like they're, they're moving into the, the kind of electric mobility space uh, in a much uh, larger way. And, uh, and I think finally the financial institutions are also now structured and restructured in a way that it can cater to this kind of a change actually. Um, uh, in, in 2013, um, there was a legislation that came in India to have 2% uh, of uh, uh, the corporate, um, uh, uh, the, the profits after tax to be put into a corporate social responsibility fund, or, or it's called the CSR um, investment. So it's basically private sector being um, formally brought into the scene by providing millions of US dollars from the private sector for investment in these green areas, actually. So these are some examples which gives us kind of uh, optimism that uh, things uh, in the developing world are also happening in a greener way, uh, even though they still see development and uh, carbon intensive development as uh, kind of a requirement to show uh, the, 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 the growing population and aspirational ladder, actually. Yeah, that's my, so I don't know whether Hazib, you would like to add from your experience. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very quickly. Yes, uh, this is a very challenging uh, task, but I believe that developing countries, they don't talk about like, let us grow first, let us develop first, think of environment later. We don't, uh, we are not in that philosophy anymore. Uh, we are not uh, adopting that philosophy anymore. But the challenge is since I want to grow uh, in economic development, I want to prosper, I want to change the graduate from this developed to developing country, the developed country, uh, definitely, we need to consider uh, climate change and the resilience. Uh, uh, and we have moved away from compensation mentality because I am not responsible for climate change. You have to compensate. I think now the issue is collaboration and uh, countries like Bangladesh uh, it is trying its best. For example, last year, Bangladesh government, although initially planned for quite a few coal powered uh, energy generation plants, but they canceled quite a few. I think uh, 12 was there, five uh, have been already canceled. So you can see that there are certain changes uh, are being, uh, being in the governance system as the government try to uh, balance uh, climate change, its responsibility towards climate change, uh, adapting towards climate change and maintaining economic growth. It's a really difficult task, uh, but uh, countries are trying very best. Thank you. Okay, the question is basically um, around this uh, urbanization and of course, uh, are there lack of technologies there? Uh, of course, uh, yeah, I think the, the customization of technology um, rather than technology per se is a bigger issue actually. So, um, for example, in many of these uh, smart city missions that member countries run, they do have a lot of bilateral collaborations, especially with uh, Germany, UK, Denmark. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so some have uh, strong technology uh, collaborations. Like for example, Denmark, uh, their leaders in the, um, in the water supply system, just, just to take one example. Um, uh, in, uh, I, I've like, I, th I think in 2016, 17, I've known about a technology that they brought into India called Leakman, which is basically one of the, because 
in many of the countries, um, the, the, the issue of non-revenue water, that uh, the water that gets supplied from the source and then what the water that reaches your doorstep, um, the, law, the, the, the efficiency is 35%, the rest is all losses. But, you know, when you, when, you, when you go to a government department and see what technology they use to track this leakages, um, uh, there's no technology being used, actually. So I have at least got an experience when I asked an official that, oh, how do you recognize that there is a leakage in a pipeline? They, so they see that in the laid area, if there is unusual vegetative growth, that gives you an indication that um, there is a leakage. That, that, that's what they use. But Leakman, for example, is a technology where they use these kind of probes which goes in and gives you a correct picture in terms of where lies the pressure difference because of the leakage. Uh, so, so such examples are there which are more bilaterally focused. But at the same time, uh, UN, uh, Commonwealth and other organizations do come up with innovation hubs where these kind of technologies are brought in and brought into one place. And these innovations do have um, a great deal of uh, innovative uh, elements there, but whether those innovative elements can be converted to financially viable models that, that the government can adopt and even the, the, the kind of grassroots level beneficiaries could uh, follow. So that's the bigger question, actually. So Commonwealth, um, in this Shogam, announced the Commonwealth Urbanization um, uh, Initiative, which is basically, again, a, a kind of a standalone declaration which was released. So I hope like that will be a good space uh, probably to talk about this and, um, and, and, and see. But, but I've seen, like many um, governments, have gone for more bilateral uh, kind of collaboration to deal with such issues after mapping the expertise, uh, um, where the expertise lies, actually. Uh, Hazib, would you like to add something here in this? Very quickly, uh, I would not talk, talk about technology and urbanization, but uh, it is linked with uh, coastal towns. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, yes, we have lots of uh, you know coastal townships which are growing and booming, but they are also vulnerable to climate change. I have seen some recent changes that I would like to share. Uh, making them climate resilient. There have been a project uh, uh, funded by uh, Asian Development Bank. They are finishing their uh, first phase this year, but as they have started designing the second phase, I can see there are certain changes in their mindset. Why I'm saying that? Because now they are introducing, incorporating how to integrate nature-based solutions to make cities and towns resilient. Uh, uh, so uh, when the next phase will start and uh, the project will be implemented in 22 uh, coastal township, I will be seeing how natural ways of tackling climate change, water logging, uh, heat, uh, uh, reducing the heat island effect, uh, how, to, how to use the nature uh, at maximum level those elements will be coming there along with engineering solutions, of course. So this is a recent change I have been observing, uh, integrating nature-based solutions in urban city. Thank you. Yeah, it's also, it's also um, a general narrative that, uh, that is gradually changing with policy is green is costly. Uh, that's, the, that's the kind of broader uh, narrative, so obviously, that requires a lot of working around to see how we make it more financially viable and not uh, uh, only a kind of a, a wealthy class um, a facility, actually. Time for one more question. Yeah, uh,
Yeah, frankly, uh, I think um, for Hazib, the, the question was like the military and uh, the defense related uh, emissions, uh, and that's currently not factoring in the in the larger national communications and of course, um, the, the, the negotiations and also the other decisions. So is there any possibility and the question is like if Commonwealth uh, uh, could could bring that. Um, it's um, I think it's, a, it's a, again a very politically sensitive area, and, uh, and I'm at that much above my pay, pay level to comment on that. But uh, but in terms of um, uh, what do you call good practices, there I think uh, um, basically if you look at other sectors, like when we when we take for example agriculture, um, many uh, developing countries do uh, tell us like we don't. Um, factor in the emissions from agriculture in our communications because adaptation is our focus and uh, we need our agriculture to feed our population. And, and uh, the, after the post-Ukraine scenario, there is also the self-sustainability angle that came into such sectors saying that even if it's at the cost of emissions, we need to ensure food for our children um, and uh, the growing population. So that that's the kind of political positions that countries are taking. So here you have a much larger question of a, a credible minimum defense, uh, uh, what do you call, um, preparedness to, 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 to support your country. So yeah, it's, a, it's an important question, but I don't have an answer right now. But but yeah, so probably that's something which I can flag to my senior management um, as a question from this platform. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know, Hasi, would you like to add? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Can we show a show of hands for both speakers, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's lunchtime now. We've got an hour. Um, if you have a voucher and a paid, please feel free to go. We've got some spare vouchers left. So if you want uh, lunch, please uh, go to uh, Bob sitting over there and uh, see you in an hour's time. Thank you very much, Hasib. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Take care. Bye.